Tonight in Q Weekly, we get the lowdown on the sad life of Oscar-winning creation Harvey Crumpet. As we chat in person to his creator, director Adam Elliott, and look in on the highlights of Adam's recent address at Globe. Hi guys, thanks so much for tuning into Q Weekly this week here on Bent TV. It's been an absolutely fantastic week here on Bent TV. My name's Jason Gruel and tonight we're coming to you from Hotel Charlesford here on St Kilda Road. Now tonight we've got a very special guest, Adam Elliott, the, of course the creator of Harvey Crumpet, here presenting at the annual Dinner for Globe. So it's been a great, fantastic night and actually, who do we have here? Hello Jason, how are you? Good, Spunky, how are you? Good, not bad. Yeah. Not, that's good. What are you up to? Oh, I thought I'd just drop in and give a bit of a chat to the lovely Globe people tonight. Yeah. Would you like to chat to Ben TV? Oh, why not? I've got a few minutes. I lived on a, a prawn farm when I was about two onwards for about three years. And it was a very isolated farm and, uh, you know, there was not much to do so I had to uh, you know, I was left up to my own devices and had to use my imagination and I think that's that's where it all began, that's where all the, you know, creativity started and, uh, you know, it was, it was um, a very uh, fertile time in my <laughs> life. <laughs> Not with the prawns, I hope. Oh, no, I, I don't, don't mention prawns, I'm sick of prawns, that's all we ate, prawns on toast, prawn casserole, prawn soup, you know. So, um, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a great time in my life and, uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure after being an Oscar award winner, of course, now you've moved on from prawns to uh, much bigger and better seafood, is that right? <laughs> plasticine, yeah. <laughs> prawns to plasticine. Yeah, no, um, plasticine animation is something I stumbled across. I actually um, wanted to be a vet and, uh, it, it, you know, unfortunately I was terrible at maths and science and when it got to the end of my high school years, I... Um, I thought, well, I've got nothing else to fall back on, and, and as I said, I was very creative and, and drew and made things out of uh, pipe cleaners and egg cartons, and um, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of uh, well spent five years down at this St Kilda Esplanade craft market, hand painting T-shirts, and then one Sunday, as I was sitting there in the rain, I thought, well, is this it? Is this is this as good as it gets? And on a whim, I enrolled at the uh, College of the Arts just down the road, um, School of Film and TV. Wow, so what gave you the transition from going from like being a designer with clothes mm. to moving on to claymation? You said that you'd always done that as a child, but mm. I mean, it's a big difference from clothes to, to creating a movie. Yeah, it was. Look, I've never really had big aspirations or goals. I've always just sort of stumbled across things and, and just trusted my intuition. And, and really, um, claymation and, and writing and directing films is, is a great um, amalgamation of all the things I love. I love making things, I love telling stories, um, I love stills photography, um, I love going to film festivals, you know, it, it's a perfect um, career for me in a way. I, I sort of regret not um, finding it until I was in my late 20s, but uh, but anyway, I had plenty of life experience. It was a good, it was a good beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you have anything that you'd like to move on to to sort of make uh, more animated films or, or nature films or anything like that, yeah. sort of move away from claymation? Well, that's funny, I, I do get asked that a lot, um, but I always reply to that with uh, people never go up to live action directors and say, well, when are you going to move into plasticine? So, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm not much good at anything else, so, you know, I'll stick with what, I'm, uh, what I know and um, as long as my films don't uh, flop, um, I'll, keep, I'll keep making them. Harvey's my fourth film and... Um, you know, hopefully not my last, and uh, absolutely, it is hard to, to top an Oscar, but you know, um, <laughs> I'll just try not to think about that and just focus on the next character and uh, hopefully, you know, do another one. Beautiful. Now, a lot of your characters you've actually had in your films because you had a trilogy, didn't you? Mm. They're quite depressing characters. The poor things go through so, <laughs> so much torment. Uh, is that coming from the prawn farm or personal experience or oh, look, an I, outlet? I, you know, so many people expect animation to be, to be gag based and, and right from the day I left film school I wanted to make films that had a lot more depth and, and layering and uh, you know everyone says why does everyone in my films die and I said well, well in real life we all die and um, why can't my characters die in the plasticine world? Um, and the thing that I try to do with all of them is to make these characters as real as possible so that if they do die you are actually moved and you empathise with them. Um, none of my characters are, 
a Disney-esque, you know, none of them fly or are fantastical or anything like that. They're all very real people. And I think that's why Harvey has worked so well around the world, is that people people really empathise with this little little man and, and relate to him and, and you know, <laughs> uh, follow his journey. And so by the end of the film, they're really uh, barracking for him. At school, Harvey was called a thick. His friend was Bogush. Bogush stuttered and had problems with his mucus. The other kids threw stones and together they were tricked, teased and tortured. Mm. Now he's actually not that little, is he? He's quite large, apparently. Yeah, Harvey's always oh, about as big as, bigger than your microphone. I was going to um, say something else then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he's bigger. The reason my characters are big is actually um, I was born with a physiological tremor through my body and uh, I shake. And so Harvey's eyes, the reason they're so big is so I can have easy access to them. And the reason he's so tall is so I can get in there. Most, most animated models are a lot smaller. Um, and that, and the, because they're that big, it means my sets have to be bigger as well. So it is a problem. I mean, really, I've, pick, I've picked the wrong profession in a way. It's like trying to be a, you know, a watch repair man or something. Um, I should really be a gabologist or something. Like <laughs> Things are big. You know. Absolutely. Now you've been uh, on many TV shows and been interviewed by a lot of people. My very good friend Adam Richards said to say hello. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just, just spoke to him before. He says you're yeah. absolutely heaven. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. What's some of the great interviews that you've had sort of throughout the world, especially you know because of the crumpet? Um, oh gee, well since the Oscars or since the nomination, um, my producer and I have done over 400 interviews. Wow. Um, and I must admit that the best one I, I have done was with um, Andrew Denton. He just, you know, we, we actually started the interview in, in the makeup room. We just started chatting. He was in that chair and I was in this one. And we just continued it onto the stage. Um, there's something about him. You, you could tell him anything, really. If he'd asked some really personal questions, I probably would have told him. <laughs> um, so he was great. Um, I've done Bert. I've done Rove. Um, I've even done uh, Burke's Backyard. Uh, with, oh, really? Oh, I've seen Don. that, actually, yeah. yeah. He uh, tried to fix my maiden hair fern. <laughs> um, yeah, no, look, um, they've all been pretty good. Um, you know, after 400 hundred interviews, you do tend to answer the same questions and, and uh, you try and find new ways of saying the same thing. But, um, you know, it's a great way of uh, psychoanalyzing yourself. You know, you, you start to realise why you make films and why they work and and um, you know you become more focused I think it's it's a great experience I highly recommend it to everybody <laughs> we'll give it a go at least anyway <laughs> yeah. now being a gay man um, you did a, a phenomenal thing on the Oscars and I'm sure many people have brought this up too but apparently uh, repeats that have been played before have cut that scene do you have any like feelings about that or any a little bit upset or <laughs> yeah it's funny I mean I I have trouble watching my speech just because it was such an emotional thing but uh, Look, it's a funny, it's, it was a funny phenomena because backstage when we went to do all the media interviews, the very first question I got was, Mr. Elliot, do you realise you've made uh, Academy history? And I immediately thought it was because I was wearing a red cravat. No one had ever, <laughs> ever done that. And they said, no, you thanked your boyfriend. And I, and I thought, oh, come on, that can't be right. 76 years of Oscars, someone must have thanked their boyfriend, even if, you know, I was an editor or somebody in some of the technical awards. But apparently not. Well, your mum makes actu the actual clothes or something, is that right? Yeah, mum, mum uh, was the chief knitter on the film. She knitted uh, little uh, 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 Brian's jackets and uh, she never knew what she was doing. I, ne <laughs> I, I never tell anyone in my family about the films until they're actually sitting in an audience trembling. Um, so, you know, no, my, my parents are great. Dad, uh, Dad was a builder, so he was helpful with the sets and uh, he had a hardware shop, which uh, was great. Uh, so, you know, look, everyone in my family, my, my, my father was an acrobatic clown, um, my brother's an actor, so we are, I do come from a family of sort of arty people, and so, you know, when I told them I wanted to be a claymator, you know, it was a little bit disappointing, I think, <laughs> to them, but, um, but they've been great. Beautiful, fantastic. So, as you can see, you can win an Oscar, you can be gay, not that that matters either way, because <laughs> all of us here are on Ben TV, <laughs> and of course, be a great guy. Do you have anything you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to say? I mean, you ask all the questions. You're oh, asked geez. all the questions all yeah, the time. Well, have I got any questions? Oh, look, no, I don't think so. Other than um, I hope everyone tonight has a great 
great time and and really I, I'm I don't see myself as a courageous person I, I just I just love animating and uh, these are all the lovely uh, repercussions of, of, of those months and months spent in my underpants in a storage unit in Marabba. So, <laughs> say la vie. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey escaped and found himself on a ship bound for a place called Australia. His world was turned upside down and back to front. Again. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Adam Elliott. Thank you. Ooh, thank you, Brett. Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, uh, members of the paparazzi. Um, look, I think I'll start at the beginning, um, not too far back, but it was, it's actually now been over four months since the actual night that we, we found out that we were nominated. And um, we'd known for you know, a month or so that we were shortlisted. There was ourselves and uh, 12 other films from around the world. And we really didn't think we had any chance of even being nominated. So um, the night came round and we were told that it would be about one o'clock in the morning, Melbourne time. And um, it was a week night, it was a school night. and. Um, I said to all my friends, look, come round, look, you know, either way we're going to get drunk, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so they all came round. Um, we'd already been doing media for about, um, you know, people had heard that we were shortlisted and we were already drawing a lot of attention. Uh, so the 7.30 report, they came round and set up all their cameras and uh, Triple J Radio came and had a live sort of a feed. And um, yeah, in the next minute there was about 30 people all squashed into my little tiny apartment in St Kilda. And, and it got to about one o'clock in the morning and the phone still hadn't rung and people were starting to get a bit restless and as I said it was a, it was a school night and, um, and then finally the phone rang and uh, I picked it up and uh, it was my friend Greg ringing to see whether the phone had rung <laughs> <coughs> and um, so I said get off the phone Greg and, uh, and within a minute or two later the phone, the phone rang and uh, there was those three words that I'll never forget and even saying them makes me, uh, makes the hairs on the back of my whatever stand up and um, it was you've been nominated and that was it and um, for us that was, that was as far as we thought we were going to go, just being nominated, as they say, is 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 such an honour. And um, you know, Harvey was a very small film. It it cost you guys, the taxpayers, four hundred thousand dollars, which is is very little for a half hour film. When you compare it to Shrek Two, which cost a hundred million dollars, so the Academy don't have. You know, everyone gets treated the same. We got treated the same as as Johnny Depp. I mean, it, which basically means. All you get are two tickets to the ceremony, two tickets to the governor's ball, and that's it. There's no free accommodation, no airfares, limos, gift bags. That gift bag thing's a big myth. Um, the only people who get gifts are the presenters. So Oprah Winfrey got a $45,000 gift bag, <laughs> and she needs it. Uh, <coughs> so um, anyway, we got, we, got, we got on the plane, and um, we got up, upgraded, as I said, and I, I turned to my producer, Melanie, and I, and I looked at her. Can't believe actually we're going to the Academy Awards. So I said, and it was the first time we'd actually had a chance to actually think about it. And I said, I actually wanted to be a vet. <laughs> <laughs> what? How did we get here? And we so we spent the, that whole 15 hours really going back and thinking. Well, you know, we never aimed to 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 get nominated. Really, the only thing for certain at the end of Harvey was that SBS were going to screen it because they were one of the major investors. So anyway, we, 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 we got to Hollywood and, um, you know, we, we still had, had uh, a lot of sleeping pills in our system and <laughs> drove on the wrong side of the road and finally made it to the, to the Roosevelt Hotel, which is where they had the very first Academy Awards. And um, it's now right opposite this brand new theatre, the Kodak Theatre, which they've custom built uh, for the Oscars. And um, the first thing we noticed when we got into our room that was that all the windows were screwed shut. And it, it, it was a bit, you know, um, you know we, it made us slightly nervous. And then we, we heard about how there were snipers on all the roofs. And this was like four days before the Oscars. And of course, we soon realised that the, uh, the ceremony would be a terrorist uh, target. 
and uh, and I remember the uh, staff downstairs saying, "But don't worry, you know, you you, you must feel very safe." And I think <laughs> there's snipers on the roofs and they screwed our windows shut so no one could stick guns out. I mean, it's just it, it was all a bit full on. Getting ready for the Oscars the next day, we started at ten in the morning. Uh, my entourage from Australia had arrived, Dan and my flatmate and a whole lot of other people. And um, we started getting ready really early. And uh, we'd hired this limousine, this big, long, white stretch limousine. It was $1,000 to take us 20 metres across, <laughs> across the road. Because, of course, you can't get out, you know, you can't turn up to the red carpet on a bus or something. So, um, so we got there and we got out of the limousine. And, you know, the first thing you do is go into this enormous big red tent before you actually get onto the red carpet. And we thought, oh, they'll be giving champagne or something in there. But no, you, everyone gets a full body search and a metal detector. And, and you're going through the big, you know, doors next to Susan Saradin and all these other celebrities. And it's just such a, a big illusion. Um, then they spit you out the other end. Then you are on the red carpet. And then there's just thousands of photographers flashing at you nonstop. And uh, we had so much fun on the red carpet because it's... Uh, divided into two lanes, there's the nominees and non-nominees, and, and as a nominee I had all this room to sort of <laughs> graze and roam and all the poor nominees, just sort of you know, non-nominees had to go in this other lane. Um, and I bumped into all sorts of people on the red carpet. Uh, the first group was uh, all the hobbits were all sort of getting their photographs <laughs> taken. And, uh, and then some people, and it, this, this is a uh, quote that I keep using, which is, um, being at the Oscars is like being at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, <laughs> except everybody's alive. <laughs> and uh, it really was like that, but there were some people who actually looked waxy anyway. There was, um, and it was great to go up to people and see how tall they are, how short they were, how beautiful they actually were in the flesh. Um, Susan Saradin was actually was one of my favourites. She was so tall and just so graceful and elegant. and. And all these other sort of, you know, younger sort of A-list actresses sort of just didn't make it. Susan was just incredible. Um, I actually, my, the person I did want to meet was Meryl Streep, but we, we couldn't find her anywhere. So anyway, we, we went in and, and we sat down and we were in, in aisle 11. We're right down the front, and we're sitting behind all the Lords of the Rings uh, crowd. And uh, the first thing you, you notice is that there's a, a little catalogue on your seat, a little program for the night. And, and I thought, I wonder how much I can get on eBay for that. <laughs> Pay my rent. And I looked down and I saw that uh, we were the seventh item, the seventh category of the night. And I thought, well, that's good. That's probably about an hour in, because as you we all know, the Oscars go for hours and hours. And then I looked and it said that uh, the presenters were um, Starsky and Hutch. They were um, <laughs> Owen Wilson and, and Ben Stiller. So. It got to our category and, and the first thing actually, but before I go into that, was when you walk into the Kodak Theatre, you realise you're actually part of a big TV show, that all this cinema is actually a big studio. It's all fake. Um, everything is fake. Um, so yeah, and in the ad breaks, everyone goes out to the bar. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a show, it's a TV show. I mean, there is 5,000 people in the studio audience. Um, and another, you know, billion or whatever outside. Um, so I got to our category, and uh, even telling you this it makes me shiver. Um, they read out the nominations, and they said, said Harvey Crump and Adam Elliott. And I looked at Melanie, and she was just, she was no emotion on her face. And this is all happening in a split second. And I thought, oh, maybe they didn't say Harvey Crump, but maybe they said Destino, and I'm just hearing that. And then I noticed the cameras running down towards me. And within a second, they were about a foot away from my head and they were giant lenses. And, and of all the stupid things that popped into my head was, on the other side of that lens is 2.4 billion people. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, why did I think of that? And then the other stupid thing I did was looked at the stage. By this stage, I'd had Melanie's hand and I'm trying to get her to stand up. And I looked at the stage and noticed that all the steps leading up to the stage were white, plastic, shiny steps. And I remember Melanie, me, Melanie telling me in the morning that she'd never worn high heels. <laughs> and I thought, I've got to get her up those steps. But somehow we floated down and we, we walked up on stage. And um, simple things like shaking hands becomes really difficult. And, and you just, 
everywhere you look are megastars and so they gave me the Oscar and, and it is very heavy and it's, um, we just found out recently it's worth about $50,000 on the, on the black market. Um, <coughs> Even more at cash converters, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, so they, they gave it to me and, you know, looked up and then you notice that there's five balconies going right up and you just, and everywhere you look are these, these megastars and um, they're all looking at you, waiting for you to say something and you're thinking, I wonder if I can speak, you know. <laughs> and so I did this trick where I always just look at one person in the audience and I talk to them and uh, I locked eyes on Oprah Winfrey <laughs> and um, I gave my speech to her and she didn't really have much of a reaction on her face and, and of course I, I you know, uh, plugged SBS uh, which as it turns out is also a porn channel in Amsterdam. <laughs> But um, it was the, you know, the best plug SBS has ever had and uh, the head of SBS took me out for dinner when I got back and, and their ratings were, were incredible. Um, so I did, did my speech and I actually had some notes written on a bit of paper in my hand but they was, my hand was so sweaty it was like paper mache by the end so I just had to ad lib and say everything off the top of my head and we, you know, as I said, we had no real clues that we, we, we'd won. And it was only in the afternoon that Melanie and I said, we better, you know, write down, you know, we can't leave out the investors, we can't leave out Geoffrey Rush, you know, we have to make sure that we have a speech just in case. And um, so I, I got through my speech and I thought, I'll do that thing at the end where you um, thrust your Oscar in the air and walk off. So I said, OK, well, I've done my speech and I went like that and realised that my notes and my Oscar was down here. <laughs> so I just went... <laughs> Um, but then, then you go backstage and, and you're backstage for over an hour and, you, and it's like another city back there. There are thousands of people and thousands of photographers and um, the first thing you do is they make you stand on this stage and all the photographers are all in cheap tuxedos on these sort of um, bleachers they call them, all in these steps. And they're all screaming at you for, for you to look into their particular camera and they're from all around the world. And so I'd be looking that way and Melanie would be looking that way and we just didn't know what to do. So in the end, I said, look, just stick your head next to mine. And we said, we'll start at the bottom and we're just going like this. And, just, <laughs> and, um, and that's why we, all the photos we've had seen since, we look shocking at these fake smiles. But you're, you're there for 10 minutes doing this with, with all these lights flashing in your eyes. And you, you soon realise what, what the paparazzi is and, and that they're animals and it's um, thank God there's a fence between you and them because <laughs> they're evil, you know. Um, and then you're ushered into another room and that's where all the journalists are who start asking questions and my first question which, um, you know, still uh, surprises me was uh, Mr Elliot, and they call you Mr once you won an Oscar. Um, <laughs> Mr Elliot, do you realise you've made Academy history and I thought, oh yes, it's that red cravat. I knew I should have worn that. And they said, no, you, you, Mr. Elliot, you thanked your boyfriend. And I thought, yes. And I thought, I'm sure someone's done that in the past. And they said, no, no, no one's ever said boyfriend. They've only said partner. And I still, I still find that hard to believe. But you know, that's what they told me. And did, was this a political statement? Was this, were you being courageous? Is this, is this is to do with the gay marriage issue in America? Blah, 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 blah. I said, no, I thanked him because if I didn't, I'm sure I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and then there was only that stood, I started to think, hang on, this, this is probably going to ruffle a few feathers. And of course, it, it did um, right across the world. Um, you know, we, we made the LA Times, we made all sorts of uh, newspapers all around the world and, um, you know, I still can't see what the big fuss is about, but I can fully understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, people say you're being brave and courageous and I said, no, I was just doing what I felt was needed to be done and, and it wasn't a political thing at all. And, um, I've won five AFI awards and I've always thanked whoever I was going out with at the time. <laughs> and, um, 
I didn't want to use the word partner either because I didn't want it to, to, to be ambiguous. Um, you know, I and, you know I was struggling to find a word to be honest, but you know. Um, I still feel boyish and Dan still feels boyish, so I thought boyfriend was suitable. I didn't want to say my root or my lover. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, look, um, it was quite an amazing uh, a night. Um, you know, we, we, we did meet all sorts of people. Having the Oscar just draws so much attention. Um, you know, Robin Williams came, oh, actually, he came running towards me at one point and, and, and grabbed me and shook me up and down and, <laughs> and said, yay for animation, and then he ran off and I said, I said, I've just been interfered with by Ro Robin Williams. And we all piled into this limo because we had that for 24 hours and we thought we were going to get our money's worth and, and we got to the Vanity Fair party and and we got out and because I had an Oscar, it was, um, I just went straight to the front of the queue and and uh, I would dare not look at who was in the queue waiting to get in, but um, we... I saw Meg Ryan and Farrah in the queue waiting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the first time in, in my life I'd ever got to the front of the queue, and I thought, gee, I wish this used to happen at the, at the market or the <laughs> queue. <laughs> I'm taken, this is a good medallion, I'm going to get them everywhere. And... Um, so we got into the Vanity Fair party and again it was just everywhere you looked was someone amazing. Dan um, stood on Naomi Campbell's dress and she, <laughs> she hissed at him apparently. And, oh, the other one was Paris Hilton. Dan saw Paris Hilton go up to a mirror and ask herself where the bathroom was. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few hours later she fell into one of the fountains of, 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 of the Lord of the Rings party. We've had all sorts of letters um, and, and emails from hundreds and thousands of them from all around the world. But there was one letter which really touched me. It was from a woman in Perth and um, it really made me realise why I make films. And it's not about the money and it's not about the fame and celebrity and all that stuff. It's a very simple letter. It said, Dear Adam, you never, you've never met me. Um, I'm from Perth and I have Tourette's syndrome. And when I read that I thought, oh no, I've offended her. And she said, uh, yours is the first film I've ever seen that has actually treated my syndrome correctly and in a beautiful manner. Please keep the films coming. And I thought, it's as simple as that. That's why I make films. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll continue to make films, but um, we'll just have to wait and see. He left the dump and tried new jobs. He seemed to get sacked a lot. He didn't know why. But he was always discovering more facts. Rubber bands last longer if refrigerated. The Bible was written by the same people who thought the earth was flat. And time does not heal all wounds.